In August, CIA Director John Brennan walked back a previous claim that US intelligence agents never work with human rights abusers. Brennan said, and I'm paraphrasing, we strive to avoid working with individuals who abuse human rights. But in some cases we do because of the vital and critical intelligence those services provide. Director Brennan's comments send two important messages, both of which Ted and I examine in the book Perilous Partners. The first is that US officials are concerned with their connection to human rights abuses. Number two, working with human rights abusers is unavoidable in statecraft. Ted will discuss the second point about why it's unavoidable to work with human rights abusers in statecraft and sort of outline the very general uh, policy recommendations that we provide in the book. What I want to explore with you is the first point, that US officials and many Americans for that matter are concerned with our connection to abuses of human rights. And my basic schema is broken down into three parts. The first is hypocrisy. It's a charge we often hear in discussions about US foreign policy. And it's because we see an inconsistency in our, in our values and, our, and then in our actions. The second is the humanitarian reasons. When we sacrifice our fundamental values, we see that it comes at enormous humanitarian costs. And as well, it can retard the development of foreign civil societies. And third is counterproductive in the sense that our alliances with authoritarian regimes, just like other client regimes, can sometimes pull the United States into conflicts divorced from its vital interests. So the first point about the inconsistency and the hypocrisy of US foreign policy. There is a profound disconnect between our professed ideals, the ideals that we revere and pay deference to and we claim make us exceptional, including individual rights, peace, democracy, and the rule of law, and then our underlying behaviors that manifest as policy be that destabilizing and overthrowing foreign governments, providing financial and military assistance to corrupt and brutal dictators, or underwriting the crimes of monstrous regimes. But what do people really mean when they say hypocrisy? When you say hypocrisy, it means that the United States claims to have a certain set of values and beliefs and doesn't adhere to them in their actions. I think the criticism really is one of a double standard in the sense that we see an inconsistent application of a certain set of principles for similar situations. And one example of that would be during the Arab Spring. And two examples of that would be Libya and Egypt. As we saw with Libya, the United States condemned Muammar Gaddafi's crackdown and pro-democracy demonstrators, and even premised the 2011 humanitarian intervention on basically humanitarian grounds, in saying that Washington would not stand for brutal dictators suppressing and violently suppressing pro-democracy advocates. Meanwhile, next door in Egypt, we see that even though Hosni Mubarak's 30-year reign of authoritarianism fell, Washington still was offering very tepid criticisms of Cairo's crackdown on both pro-Morsi demonstrators and pro-democracy demonstrators. And that's because since 1978, Egypt has received over $60 billion in US military and financial assistance, over half of that to the purchase of US manufactured weapons and arms. But then also, the United States also considers Egypt an anchor of stability in the Middle East, because it was successfully pulled out of the pan-Arab struggle against Israel. Of course, it's an odd construction in some respects because Egypt would have the most to lose in any future conflict with Israel. Moreover, the current al-Sisi regime, similar to its predecessors, Hosni Mubarak and Anwar Sadat, would, would uh, of course, uh, through the denial of, of free speech, it, it realizes that it can ignore the conditions on aid because they know that US officials will not revoke US assistance. This is a problem of the sort of patron-client ties that we have. And we notice that USAID, unfortunately, underwrites a regime that perpetuates its power through the denial of free speech, arbitrary imprisonment, and other forms of savage repression. So that we see the different standards and apply to one situation and to others. And there are many examples of this, both during the Arab Spring and during the Cold War. And certainly, this double standard charge or this hypocrisy charge can damage our credibility and delegitimize our allies. And even though it's very powerful, it's persuasive, and it's a valid argument to have, it doesn't go far enough in providing an argument for opposing US alliances with authoritarian states. And this leads to my second point, in the sense that we see that when we do harm our values, it doesn't happen in just merely an abstract or philosophical sense, but in truly tangible and heinous ways. When we claim that our values are universal because they apply equally to everyone, irrespective of background, and yet at the same time, we overthrow governments. We provide a prop to the course of institutions of foreign governments. We assert for foreign people their agency and their self-determination. And it undermines their ability to find out how best to achieve their potential. And it prevents them from asserting meaningful change over their own political systems. One example of this is in Guatemala, similar to Syria, 
Cuba, Iran, and Congo, and other nationalist independence movements during the Cold War that the United States tried to undermine. In 1954, the United States helped overthrow the democratically elected government in uh, uh, President Arbenz. The agrarian land reform that he, that he imposed nationalized over a million acres of land, and he gave it to peasants. Of course, most of that land belonged to a giant US corporation called United Fruit Company. In the United States Army, the United States helped the uh, Guatemalan military replace Arbenz with a pro-American puppet that overturned the program. The coup was called Operation Success, and it led to three decades of military rule that slaughtered peasants, tortured regime critics, and burned insurgents alive. At least 200,000 Guatemalans perished after Operation Success. Another example, moving from Central America to South Asia, is Bangladesh. West Pakistan's US-backed military junta maintained the power of ethnic Punjabis in West Pakistan. And what they did is that they ignored and failed to address the underlying socioeconomic grievances of the ethnic Bengalis in East Pakistan. And what became known as the 1971 Bangladesh crisis, West Pakistan used US tanks and planes to suppress Bengali separatists. Journalists estimated that more than 1 million Bengalis were slaughtered in this crisis, and that's the low end estimate. US officials in India and in Dhaka, in West Pakistan's capital, described West Pakistan's actions as a selective genocide. Henry Kissinger, the national security advisor under President Richard Nixon, later, in acknowledge, later acknowledged in his memoirs about the Bangladesh crisis, quote, there was some merit to the charge of moral insensitivity, unquote. Now, beyond charges first of hypocrisy and of course of the humanitarian cost of policy, there's also another problem of backing tyrants. And this is of course the, an issue when it comes to backing any sort of client regime, is that it often pulls the United States into foreign conflicts divorced from its vital interests and security. And two examples illustrate this point. The first is Vietnam. Of course, the argument for intervening in Indochina was the domino theory, the notion that the rise of a nationalist independent movement in, in Saigon would lead to a demonstration effect across the region and strengthen communism both in Southeast Asia and encourage communists to strike elsewhere. In 1963, with Washington's encouragement, the South Vietnamese military overthrew and executed President Diem. Political chaos ensued in Saigon and Washington Americanized the war. More than half a million US troops would fight in Vietnam more than 58,000 would perish, and it led to bitter disagreements that tore our own society apart. The second example, moving from Southeast Asia to the Arabian Peninsula, is Saudi Arabia. In August 1990, Saudi Arabia main, remained militarily too weak to defend itself when Iraqi troops invaded Kuwait. As a result, the United States marshaled an international coalition with broad Arab support to oust the Iraqis from Kuwait. But as former Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz said of the 12-year US troop presence in Saudi Arabia, quote, it's been a huge recruiting device for Al-Qaeda. In fact, if you look at bin Laden, one of his principal grievances was the presence of so-called crusader forces on the Holy Land, Mecca and Medina, unquote. What Wolfowitz was getting at is that Muslims took umbrage with the stationing of US troops on Muslim holy soil. And also, bin Laden actually exploited the fact that Washington supported what he called, quote, apostate regimes in Riyadh, Cairo, Amman, Islamabad, and elsewhere. We must remember that Saudi Arabia bans free speech, political parties, and competitive elections. It has very austere social restrictions on religious freedom and women's rights. And it has a barbaric penal system of public floggings, beheadings, and crucifixions. An added problem of the 1990-1991 Persian Gulf War is, again, the idea that we violate our own principles. Again, the double standard charge comes up again. In the sense that the United States claimed that Iraq's invasion of Kuwait was both illegal and a violation of international law. Now, fast forward to 2003, the United States invades Iraq, overthrows Saddam Hussein, and does so without UN approval again exposing a double standard and how we push other countries around. Let me conclude my remarks by tying these historical examples together. Number one, the hypocrisy or double standard charge, one that we often hear in discussions of US foreign policy, and one that's, I think, very powerful and very persuasive because we do see an undermining of our credibility and a delegitimizing of our allies and the legitimacy of our allies, especially in the eyes of their own people. But still, as some would argue, and I'm sure many in this room, it still does not go far enough in providing an argument for opposing relationships with authoritarian regimes. That leads to the second argument. How our values become sacrificed at enormous humanitarian costs and retards the development of foreign civil societies. And third, 
These relationships, like many other client relationships, have the potential to pull the United States into foreign conflicts, divorce from its security. I will conclude with just two quick takeaways in the course of researching and writing uh, the book. And the first is something that I think many of you would agree in that, you know, our values do resonate abroad. Our very liberal principles, Western principles of democracy and rule of law and human rights and women's rights, but they often carry a local flavor. For instance, you always hear about China, you know, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. I think the same is true in many parts of the Muslim world, where you find many, many individuals who like elements of Western liberal democracy, but they also like Sharia law. So it's, it's that conflict. It's what these, these ideas exist in tension with one another. And oftentimes what you find is these universal values become entwined with local customs. The second takeaway is that our values genuinely and truly inspire foreign people. They really do animate their ideas of what they hope to achieve. And it becomes a guiding principle in some respects because our values remain aspirational. Meanwhile, at the same time, many foreign citizens harbor a corrosive cynicism toward the United States and its policies. And that cynicism can become the prevailing mentality. What I found in the course of my research, especially doing a lot of field work in Afghanistan and Pakistan, you talk with people who were you know, passive supporters of militant groups, yet they also supported the separation of powers and the rule of law. So I think these ideas exist, they coexist in seeming contradiction. And when, what I've noticed is that when we pay deference to our values and then we breach them through our behavior, it can reduce the likelihood that foreign people will reconcile their own values favorably with our own. Thank you.